Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Irish Heart Foundation's online conference on Tobacco 21, the case for raising the legal age for the sale of tobacco in Ireland. This conference is being brought to you by the Irish Heart Foundation in association with Ash Ireland, Council of the Irish Heart Foundation. My name is Norma Cronin, and I am chairperson of Ash Ireland, which is the Council of the Irish Heart Foundation. So I am delighted to welcome you all here today, those who are joining us virtually, and of course, all our speakers. We have a great lineup of speakers uh, and great presentations from the United States and of course from Ireland. So I'm really looking forward to some excellent speakers and presentations. It is our hope that this conference would advance the case for tobacco control in Ireland and control policymakers. We it's geared at we're gearing this towards our policymakers, the media, the general public, but most importantly, with the Minister for Health, the government, and opposition parties. It is our firm belief, backed up by evidence from other jurisdictions who have introduced Tobacco 21 laws, that increasing the legal age will bring a multitude of public health benefits and save lives. So we know that um, from, ex from research that almost 55% of respondents from the recent Eurobarometer report started smoking on a regular basis before they were 18. So this will not only with 21 reduce smoking levels among 18 to 20 year olds, but it will also lower smoking among teenagers too, and help deter smoking initiation at this, this critical time for young people. You all know smoking is the leading cause of preventable death in Ireland and continues to kill almost 6,000 people every year. Furthermore, nicotine is highly addictive substance that is toxic for young people with developing brains. We must do everything we can to protect our youth from the dangers of smoking. However, recent research has shown from the Tobacco Free Research Institute that current smoking among teenagers has increased after two decades of consistent reductions. Not only has youth smoking increased in re recent years, but e-cigarette use among those age groups has risen also in this time. We accept that e-cigarettes are safer than traditional cigarettes, but we know that e-cigarettes are not harm-free. And we are concerned that the gateway effect they pose to young people will lead to addiction and eventual tobacco consumption. So it is in this regard that we believe it is imperative that the government seriously consider raising the legal age for the sale of all forms of tobacco including e-cigarettes from 18 to 21 to help reduce smoking and e-cigarette use. Ireland has a strong tradition of implementing progressive tobacco control leg legislation for the benefit of public health. But we cannot afford to rest on our laurels. And we believe it is time for the government to once again show strong leadership and raise the legal age for the sale of all forms of tobacco, including e-cigarettes, to 21 years. Ireland was the first country in the world to introduce the smoke-free at work legislation. So let's be the first country in the EU to implement Tobacco 21 and send out a strong signal that Ireland is committed to putting public health first and protecting our young people. So, before I hand over to uh, over to Professor Shane Allwright, who will introduce our speakers, I just would like to run over a few housekeeping rules. Firstly, all audience members will have their cameras off at this stage and microphones muted. However, we will be holding two Q and A panel sessions today, as we invite all invite all of you, our audience, to submit questions through the text box on your screen that we will put to our speakers during the panel session. As we are limited with time, we will do our best to follow up on any audience questions that don't get asked today. And we would encourage everyone here to tweet the conference 
with the hashtag Tobacco21. The conference will be recorded, so people who could not make it today will be able to view the presentations afterwards, and a follow-up survey will be sent to everyone here after the conference to get your views on Tobacco21. So finally, I would like to say a big thank you to you all, uh, all our speakers who will be presenting today, and to all of you who are joining us virtually for this critical conference on the case for raising the legal age for the sale of tobacco in Ireland. And now I would like to introduce Professor Shane Allwright, who is Associate Professor at Trinity College Dublin and member of Ash Ireland Council of the Irish Heart Foundation who will follow up with moderating this first session of the afternoon. So enjoy this great conference and uh, great speakers. Thank you. Thanks, Norma. It gives me great pleasure now to introduce and welcome our first speakers, Dr. Rob Crane and Amanda Swenson Turner. Dr. Crane, is a clinical professor in the Department of Family Medicine at Ohio State University. He has an abiding interest in preventing nicotine addiction and has received a number of prestigious awards for his tobacco control work. He co-chaired the coalition that helped pass smoke-free legislation in a dozen central Ohio communities. And this led subsequently to the introduction of statewide legislation. He is the founder and president of the Preventing Tobacco Addiction Foundation and Tobacco 21. Amanda Swenson Turner is an experienced public affairs professional. She has worked for national and local political campaigns, leading education and healthcare nonprofits, and managing corporate community relations and philanthropic initiatives, as well as corporate political affairs strategies. She joined the Preventing Tobacco Addiction Foundation in 2019 as executive director. Rob and Amanda are going to jointly present a talk entitled Tobacco 21 in the USA. But before handing over the microphone, for those who have not previously come across these organizations, I'd like to explain that the Preventing Tobacco Addiction Foundation and Tobacco 21 were founded by Dr. Crane in 1996 with the mission of reducing the health and economic impact of tobacco use and nicotine addiction through education, through advocacy and through policy change. Based in Columbus, Ohio, these organizations work all across the United States to introduce legislation to help prevent youth initiation into tobacco products, including e-cigarettes, with a focus on policies that limit the tobacco industry's access to young people and that put the onus on retailers to comply with the law and not sell to underage kids. Rob, Amanda, I'd be delighted now if you could go ahead with your presentations. Thank you. Good morning. Let me switch to sharing my screen. So this morning, I want to start with a quick medieval tale. And many of you may be wondering about this notion of adulthood or maturity at the age 21 and how it came about. It does seem like an odd choice of numbers. So this, this is a rendition of an Irish medieval knight and it all starts here with the weight of armor and the need for maturity in battle. And actually it starts with this guy, William the Conqueror. It was under his leadership that a system of apprenticeship to knighthood became more formalized. Between the suit of armor, the helmet, the sword and the shield, a mounted knight might carry an extra 35 kilograms into battle. It was thought that a squire must be the age of 21 to carry that weight and more importantly, have sufficient maturity and courage to lead in battle. And so for nine centuries of English law and eventually Irish and American law, 21 was considered the age of maturity, thus establishing the age of majority. And then came a social revolution that began in the US but quickly spread across the pond the granting of voting franchise to those age 18. Now, you might ask from where the age 18 magically arise. That, of course, is the end of high school in the United States or secondary school in Ireland. And now we come to the Vietnam War, a war that was fought by more younger soldiers than previous wars due to the draft, an age group that was drafted yet not old enough to vote, therefore prompting the lowering of the age of majority to 18. 
It turns out that voting is one thing, but making mature long-term choices might be another thing. And it may very well be that William the Conqueror was onto something that neuroscience is just now understanding. So again, we are with the Preventing Tobacco Addiction Foundation, also Tobacco 21. And you've already heard our bios and our intros, but I want to go a little deeper about why we do the work that we do. I suspect many of you have similar stories about why you work in tobacco control and why you care about this issue. I'm originally from the southern part of the United States and had a grandfather who was a tobacco farmer, but unfortunately passed away from lung cancer when I was 10 years old. Rob had a father who was a lifelong smoker. Uh, we call him a Mark Twain smoker because he claimed that giving up smoking was easy because he had done it hundreds of times. So this fight isn't just about isn't because it's important for public health, that's not our only reason. It's also something that's personal and drives us each day. So I realize I'm preaching to the choir. We've already heard some of these stats at the start of the, of the conference, but I think it's good to make sure we remind ourselves um, of these statistics so that you're better armed against naysayers. So let me run through the dangers of nicotine and tobacco briefly. One in five deaths in Ireland are due to smoking. And new data examines nicotine's role as a gateway to the abuse of other substances and a potential trigger for serious mental illness in susceptible individuals. Many also forget that tobacco, excuse me, many also forget that tobacco product use is one of the leading cause of preventable disease and disability and death in the world. So let's put some numbers to this. Annually, smoking and secondhand smoking kills more than 6,000 Irish citizens, more than half a million Americans, and more than 8 million people in the world. When we say kill, we mean takes 10 years off of a normal lifespan. Looking at the comparison of loss of life events, do you think the effort of your health departments or government policymakers commiserate with the magnitude of this issue? I'm guessing not. I'll venture to say that it is also widespread knowledge that smoking while pregnant is terrible for the fetus, as well as for the mother, not to mention the dangers of secondhand smoking once the baby is born. According to a study by the Institute of Medicine that examined the public health implications of raising the minimum age for purchasing tobacco products to 21, amongst the many benefits they shared in doing so, they included that the policy is important in reducing pregnancy complications, including infant mortality, reducing infant mortality rates. This is important to note as many women give birth in their early 20s. So why raise the age to 21? 95% of current smokers start before the age of 21 and having a cigarette by the age 18 makes it twice as likely to become a lifelong smoker. I've heard countless stories of folks starting as early as 14 and easily buying tobacco products claiming it was for their parents. Later, Dr. Cream will go into more detail about the vulnerability of the brain during these formative years. One in three students have vaped in the past month. So if we were all in person right now, I'd have us look to our right and to our left and decide which one of us has a teenage child that has vaped this month. Raising the age from 18 to 21 helps remove the access to under 18 social circles. 18 year olds, 19 year olds are in class and ride the bus with 14, 15, 16 and 17 year olds. Removing the access removes the chances of starting. And we can't claim all of our victory as something we've done on our own. With the enormous size of big tobacco and their range of egregious practices, we clearly have to work with partners working with coalitions the most effective way to get good policies passed. And we value the dozens of partners that you see here on the screen to work with us on this important work. In fact, in 2019, some 15 partner organizations collaborated on what is known as the Model Tobacco 21 policy, which has been used in dozens of states and cities to guide legislators on writing best practices for Tobacco 21 laws. And this is a model policy you can find at our website at tobacco21.org. So now I'm gonna take you on another journey, not as far back as the medieval times, but I wanna share with you the progression of Tobacco 21 in the United States and start in the year 2005. 
in a little town called Needham, Massachusetts, a Western suburb of Boston. Their city council decided to raise the tobacco sales age to 21. Initially, no one thought this would be effective policy because you can literally cross the street to another town. However, after an insurance company did some, a study of the 20 towns west of Boston, they found some shocking results. This was a study that looked at various social issues in high school, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But what jumped from the page was the steep decline of smoking after the passage of Tobacco 21. The high school smoking rate dropped by half and frequent smoking in youth dropped by 62%. So this policy proved to be effective and we were off and it started to spread like wildfire. In 2013, thanks to then Mayor Bloomberg who hates tobacco and loves statistics, New York City became the first major city to raise the age to 21. Moving to 2014, Hawaii County and several other cities passed tobacco 21. The following year, the state of Hawaii became the first state to pass statewide Tobacco 21. And unfortunately, I was not with the organization then or else I would have seen this policy pass firsthand. Moving on to 2016, California became the second state to pass Tobacco 21 in addition to many other cities across the country, including Washington, DC. As you can see, the movement kept growing in large part due to the vaping, the vaping epidemic that was growing in the United States. By 2018, the entire state of Massachusetts raised the age to 21. And I'd also like to note that Massachusetts was the first state to pass a comprehensive flavored tobacco product ban. Then in the fall of 2018, our then FDA commissioner, Scott Gottlieb declared youth vaping an epidemic. However, millions of kids were already addicted to nicotine through e-cigarettes. The media reported almost daily about the dangers of vaping. And by the time the legislative sessions opened in early 2019, Big Tobacco and their e-cigarette partners knew they had to publicly support policy efforts to keep their products away from youth. Despite their known efforts for specifically targeting and addicting youth to nicotine. The largest e-cigarette distributor in the United States called Juul likes to say they are a safe alternative to cigarettes, but if that was true, why would Altria, the maker of Marlboro, invest 12.8 billion for a 35% stake in Juul? So in 2019, the publicity stunt by Juul and Big Tobacco began as they publicly supported Tobacco 21 policies in state houses across the country and deployed hundreds of lobbyists to make their case for Tobacco 21. The problem was they supported extremely weak Tobacco 21 policies without any enforcement, which they knew wouldn't be effective in preventing youth initiation to nicotine. But that didn't matter. This was a move to make them look good to the public after facing massive scrutiny for blankly marketing kits. Since then, we have been battling the tobacco industry in state houses and pushing for strong Tobacco 21 laws that will have a positive effect on youth use of all tobacco products. Like all policy, the devil is in the details. You can raise the age to 51 years old, but if there's no enforcement or accountability placed on the retailer who makes profit from selling these products, it doesn't matter what the age is. Then in 2020, as part of the federal spending bill, President Trump signed into law Federal Tobacco 21 raising the legal age across, excuse me, the legal sales age across the country from 18 to 21. So tobacco 21 in the United States is law of the land. But before you start applauding us and popping champagne, there are se several things to note. First, again, this was an effort backed by big tobacco. Remember the devil's in the detail and there's more work to be done. Here's a quick screenshot if you want to take a picture of the high level points of the Federal Tobacco 21 law. And I won't go through all of these, um, but just to remind you that no law works unless it is enforced at the federal, state, and local level. So with that, I'm gonna introduce it to Dr. Rob Crane, who will take us through, continue to take us through the evolution of e-cigarettes and how this impacts the brain. Thank you, Amanda. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to change gears for a moment and talk about nicotine 
e-cigarettes and kids' brains. Turns out in 2003, a Chinese pharmacist named Han Li, working for the Golden Dragon Tobacco Company, developed the first electronic cigarette, allegedly because his father died of lung cancer. The name for the first product translates to Sig Alike. Of note, Mr. Leek was apparently unable to stop smoking using his own product. But very briefly, uh, this device, the Sig Alike, has a process in common with all cigarettes. Flavors and nicotine, e-cigarettes that is, flavors and nicotine are mixed with an organic solvent, usually propylene glycol or glycerol, that's heated to about three to 400 degrees Celsius using a small battery that produces a vapor that's eventually inhaled. But after Sigalikes, there was a realization that maybe modeling your product after one of the most hated products in the world was not the greatest marketing idea. So along came the second generation, which was mostly a colorful rendition of the first. But in 2010, technical advances uh, led to the vape mod or the tank mod. These are modifiable devices where the users had the ability to adjust the voltage and resistance in the battery to cause a change in the vapor and in the nicotine delivery. But in 2015 came the blockbuster out of Pax Labs, the Jewel device, generation four. These were sleek, high-tech devices that use replaceable fluid nicotine pod. It was attached to what looked like a USB flash drive. Bingo, a huge hit. And Generation 5 was really a single-use device that was used to escape the regulation on flavored pods that came in 2019. But interestingly, next, in Ireland, Jewel does not exist, pulled off the market in 2020. Same thing with Puff Bar, because in the EU, the concentration of uh, e-liquid is limited to 2% nicotine, which is less than half the amount in usual Jewel and, and uh, uh, Puff Bar uh, products. And they simply were not addictive enough to maintain their product margin. Next slide. It's a reminder that unless one is careful with definitions and descriptions, regulators end up with a frustrating game of whack-a-mole. As soon as one dangerous product comes under regulation, ingenious exploitation pops up another. Next. So initially, e-cigarette makers used the traditional selling techniques of tobacco, sex, glamour, celebrities, flavors. But Juul, Juul recognized these as yesterday's marketing techniques. Next. They said yes to celebrities and note the exploitation of Ariana Grande here who neither vapes nor smokes. Next. But then the full on move to music and especially social media, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, and all the lighthearted fun that kids really enjoyed brought them on board. Next. Jewel became an absolute overnight phenomenal fad. In the US mostly, but somewhat in Ireland as well. But in the US, half of kids had tried Jewel by 2018. It would have been just a fad, like fidget spinners or twerking or blue hair or Pokemon Go, well, except for one thing, addictive nicotine. Next. So the debate rolls on. Do e-cigarettes help combustible tobacco users quit? Versus how many kids are addicted because e-cigarettes seductive appeal, their design and their high levels of delivered nicotine. Next. For me at least, that question is answered. The e-cigarette epidemic threatens to erase decades of progress with adolescent use. This is the US. But something similar goes on in Ireland. E-cigarette proponents will answer, well, cigarette smoking hasn't really gone up with the advent of E6, but that statement is not true in Ireland. You have 15% increase in the last two years among 15 and 16 year olds smoking. But even in the US, look more closely at this graph. Click, next. Does that help? This is where we should be as opposed to where we are. Next. 
the balance is off, way off. This is especially true as more studies show that e-cigarettes do not, do not work well as cessation device. Next. I don't want to belabor this, but Ireland and the EU has done a pretty good job of advertising restriction. And that's helpful. In the US, we can't do that. Flavors still exist in Ireland, but the nicotine levels are lower and that helps as well. But nonetheless, you can do more as we have done. Next. The reason of course is this. The reason for the season, this is nicotine. Others may claim that nicotine is benign, but it's not. Deeply inhaled, alveolar absorption nicotine is the most powerful addictive drug in the world. Next. So you may ask yourself, why in the world would the tobacco plant even make nicotine? Next. Well, correct, of course, it's an insecticide, a very potent insecticide. The funny thing is it has the exact same effect on us as it does on locusts. We just titrate the dose better. And what is the primary effect on both of our brains? Next, is the release of the brain's most important neurotransmitter, dopamine. Dopamine release is deeply pleasurable. It reduces hunger and thirst and desire. It increases focus and induces calm. Dopamine is a great neurohormone, but like any drug, Overuse causes serious problems. Next. Where does dopamine work? It's expressed in a lot of places, but the primary effect is in the deepest, most ancient parts of the brain. Its most powerful psychological effects occur in the mesolimbic system, the reward system of the ventral tegmental area, the VTA, and the nucleus accumbens. These are the areas that we share with this bad guy. Next from 60 million years ago. This is the reptilian part of the brain. This is where anger and lust live. This is fear and desire. This is the area that cannot be taken lightly. This is an area that can dominate rational thought. If you repeatedly mess with this area of an adolescent's brain, bad things are very likely to happen. Next. Let's talk about nicotine absorption a little bit. You've probably seen this slide before. On the right are our nicotine replacement therapies. But you see that the engineered combustible cigarette trumps them all for delivery. This graph unfortunately doesn't tell the story because venous or plasma levels are not what the brain sees. The brain sees what's coming up the artery. Next, arterial levels are 10 times higher with the free base drug delivery system that is the modern cigarette. No matter how much gum you chew, you're never gonna have the same effect as a cigarette spike. An adult male's lung alveoli, if they're flattened out, would have the same area as a single's tennis court. The mouth and throat and small airways simply can't compete. This hugely different pharmacokinetics make deeply inhaled alveolar nicotine a functionally different drug than NRTs or e-cigs that are absorbed in the mouth and upper airways. Next. So this, next slide. This is a representation of what the brain sees when with one cigarette puffed 10 times, spike up, fall down, spike up, fall down, spike up, fall down, and finally, a hard fall. Especially nowadays when most indoor places are smoke-free. The smoker spends most of his time in acute withdrawal. Next. Now multiply that times 12 cigarettes a day, not far off what the current average is. That's 44,000 hits per year to the deep brain. This actually changes the architecture of the brain. Next. This is what it does to kids. The very beauty of their highly plastic, quick learning brains becomes their vulnerability to malignant change. Certainly some of this is because of the risk taking that kids do. But good studies show that they can, we can isolate risk factors that show that early nicotine exposure is causative, not just associative. Deeply inhaled, high spiking nicotine changes brains. 
Next. Let's talk a moment about addiction. What is it? Nobel Prize winner Eric Kandel and his wife, neuropsychologist Denise Kandel, explain nicotine's effect as a function of deep, profound memory, a hijacking of neural pathways. Now let's say transient memory is largely chemical, you know, a synaptic connection based on previously established memory. When you look around the room, your brain is awash in neurotransmitters, lighting up all those old connections. But to remember something over the long haul, you actually have to grow new dendrites and new receptors. There's an actual architectural change in the brain. This growth requires turning on parts of the cell's DNA. And that's done with cell chemicals called transcription factors. Some factors select for different kinds of growth patterns. These short circuit hijack pathways of addiction are best turned on by one particular factor, delta FOS B, and nothing. Nothing turns on delta FOS B like nicotine. These enhanced connections to arc toward craving, toward driven behavior. Over the next few years, I think you'll hear a lot about delta FOS B. We have known for years that smoking is associated with a variety of other addiction and mental health problems. 95% of alcoholics smoke, 95% of schizophrenics, the vast majority of those with bipolar disease, as well as other drug addictions, also smoke. For years, psychiatrists, with the support of the industry, have told us, oh, oh, they're just self-medicating. And they probably are, the same way that an alcoholic calms his jitters with an eye opener in the morning. But this isn't useful in the long run. In fact, the rapid ups and downs of nicotine and dopamine clearly destabilize affects and may initiate or worsen chronic mental illness and substance abuse in those who are susceptible. Next slide. One last thing. This is kind of casually overlooked. The vaping industry, including Juul and Puff Bar and many Irish e-cigarettes, have actually changed the chemical composition of the nicotine they're peddling. They've added benzoic acid to base nicotine to create a whole new chemical, nicotine benzoate. This novel, novel chemical is what our kids are getting. Why? Nicotine, nicotine absorption is, no back one, is pH dependent. Alkaline free base nicotine is absorbed in seconds, but nicotine benzoate takes minutes especially from e-cigarettes, which heat you a lower temperature than regular cigarettes. This causes less of a hit, a harsh hit, to the back of the throat, and less squeeze to the more delicate nervous systems of a kid. Next slide. An analogy that's appropriate is that of oral Oxycontin, an injectable heroin. Oxy is easily started, slow to absorb, but plenty potent to reduce addiction. Heroin, on the other hand, is a bit tough to get started for obvious reasons, but once started, it hits much harder, much faster, and for some, it's even cheaper. Next. E-cigarettes are like Oxycontin. Fairly easy to get, a soft entry, but plenty potent enough to develop addiction. On the other hand, Marlboro's, Ireland's, and the U.S.'s most popular combustible cigarette, delivers a massive dose a fine particle, free base nicotine to the deep alveolar lung that hits within six to 10 seconds. Actually, faster than heroin. This is probably the reason why so few smokers, despite all the hype, actually quit using e-cigarettes. If they do vape, they vape when they can't smoke. And these dual users get the cardiopulmonary injury that comes from both sets of toxicities. Well, that's some of the why. Let's hear some more of the how. Back to Amanda. Thank you, Rob. So we talked about how this was kicked off in 2005, but it really ramped up in 2015. And that is because of a study that came out. The Institute of Medicine of the U.S. National Academies of Science released its comprehensive 388-page compendium of data supporting raising the tobacco sales age. This resource brought together the broad range of health advocates agencies support the policy, uh, support the policy regarding raising the minimum legal sales age to 21. 
So what does a strong Tobacco 21 law look like? Again, you can go to our website at tobacco21.org, but the high level areas that I wanna focus on are a strong law has comprehensive definitions that would include future and current tobacco products as well as e-cigarettes. It would have enforcement, mandated compliance checks on each retailer annually and strong penalties on the retailer. So this is a meaningful penalty schedule that will suspend and or revoke a retailer's ability to sell tobacco products after repeat violations. And licensing, having a comprehensive list of who is selling tobacco, both combustible and e-cigarette products, provides you a list of who to check with that strong enforcement program that you've already created. It also uh, allows for an annual fee to help fund enforcement. Again, you can go to our website, as you see at the bottom, tobacco21.org, to see details of what a strong Tobacco 21 law will include. And recently, we're excited to share that a, a study came out that we will make sure the organizers of the conference shares with everybody. Uh, they examined Tobacco 21 laws in the state of Minnesota. And bottom line, Tobacco 21 works. And we hope all of you uh, can understand the benefits of raising the sales age. Um, and we're happy after the next presentation to answer more questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Rob, for two really fascinating and very different um, but interlocking presentations. Um, the amazing developments in the neurobiology of, of tobacco addiction on the brain was, 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 was is really startling. And the um, fascinating development of the Tobacco 21 legislation, uh, really, really interesting. And just the evidence is really coming in strongly now uh, that it works. So that, that's tremendously helpful. Um, I'd like to remind the audience that they, if they have questions, they can submit them via the, uh, the text box on either the previous two presentations or the previous presentation or the one that's coming up. And we will invite Rob and Amanda back for the Q&A after the next presentation. So thank you, Rob, and thank you, Amanda. Really super interesting presentations. I'd, I'd now like to uh, welcome uh, and introduce Dr. Paul Kavner. Paul is known to most of us who work in tobacco control in Ireland. He's a consultant in public health medicine at the National Health Intelligence Unit, providing epidemiological evidence and advice and public health support to health information system design, health service reform, and health service planning and evaluation. In addition, and particularly relevant to this afternoon, Paul is clinical lead for the HSC Tobacco Free Ireland programme and in this role recently led the development of Ireland's first national stop smoking guidelines. Paul's talk is entitled State of Tobacco Control in Ireland, Time to Move from Business as Usual to Endgame. Paul. Okay, thanks very much Shane. Um, now, Okay, so hope I'm sharing okay. Um, great, well, th thanks very much for the introduction, Shane, and thanks to yourself, Norma, Ash Ireland, and the Irish Heart Foundation for the invitation to speak this afternoon. Um, and really want to begin by acknowledging the great work and the leadership role that Ash Ireland and, and the Irish Heart Foundation have played in terms of the um, significant progress that we've made in terms of tobacco control in Ireland and very much welcome the discussion that you're opening today in terms of where do we need to go next and that very much sets the scene in relation to what I'd like to speak about. Um, so this is confirmation that I have no um, uh, uh, association or have not received any financial contribution from the tobacco or e-cigarette industry. So um, some of us may not wonder why it is we're here this afternoon to talk about tobacco control, bearing in mind everything that's going on at the moment, uh, particularly the issues and the challenges that we're facing in relation to the current surge of COVID activity in Ireland. Um, there could be a view that tobacco control in Ireland is a done deal, you know, that very much uh, where we, we've gotten this problem under control and everything is over the line. And certainly we've been successful in terms of the design and implementation of a number of high impact strategic policy initiatives over the last number of decades. 
uh, and those initiatives then have translated into declining population prevalence of smoking. And as a result of that, uh, back in 2013, uh, our government set the very bold ambition of Ireland becoming tobacco free by the year 2025. Uh, and at that point, then there will be a smoking prevalence of less than 5% across the population. But I think it's fair to say that we're not there yet. Uh, so just calling out a number of statistics that people have heard already this afternoon, reminding us of the urgency that there continues to be in terms of tackling uh, the issue of smoking in the population. So each week we have over 100 tobacco related deaths in Ireland. So that's the equivalent of a full bus of people dying every week from tobacco related illness. Um, each year there are over 55,000 hospitalizations in Ireland, enough to fill the Aviva Stadium and all of those related to smoking and secondhand smoke expo exposure. So one in 20 of our hospital, hospital inpatient episodes in Ireland are due to smoking. Um, while we are making progress in terms of declining smoking prevalence, we're well off track in terms of the 2025 ambition set by government. So I think it's fair to say that uh, Tobacco Free Ireland, you know, we're certainly not at a game over yet. And um, while I think it's important that we look at this from the perspective of the whole population, and, and some of the statistics that I've cited there relate to this issue from the whole population perspective. For me, really, the, the litmus test in terms of the progress that we're making has to be when we look at this problem through the eyes of our most vulnerable in the population. Um, so this slide here is uh, showing a picture of Grace and of Jack. Uh, so people may have picked up the coverage that we had recently uh, from the publication uh, by the CSO of their uh, annual statistical uh, yearbook. And they told us that the most popular name for girls born um, in 2020 in Ireland was Grace, and the most popular name for boys was Jack. Now, what they've also told us, but which didn't receive the same level of coverage, is that were Grace to be born in one of our most deprived uh, areas in the country, she could expect to live four and a half years less than uh, her counterpart that was born in a more affluent part of the country. And similarly, Jack, if Jack were born in one of our more deprived neighbourhoods, in terms of the uh, fair and equal distribution of the opportunity to live a life in good health. And smoking is, while that's while, while the socioeconomic differentials in terms of health is a very complex issue, actually smoking is a very key driver of that problem. So we know that smoking uh, kills one in two people uh, who sustain the habit. Uh, so um, the social uh, differentials that there are in terms of smoking are a very key driver in terms of the uh, unequal and unfair distribution of health across our population. So how does this play out, out then for Jack and Grace over the course of their life? Well, firstly, um, Jack and Grace could expect to be born um, uh, and they could expect that during pregnancy they would have been exposed, more likely to be exposed to smoking. Uh, than a child uh, that was born in a more um, affluent part of Ireland. Um, then as a young child, uh, they're more likely to be exposed to secondhand smoke in the home. And then um, as they grow up, they're more likely to see uh, parents, uh, they're more likely to see uh, people in their social network, people in their community smoking as well. Very powerful role models that sort of reverse the denormalization that we've been very successful at achieving here in Ireland. And that has been a big driver in terms of the reduction in smoking prevalence that we've observed. So um, the, the early life experience um, in terms of exposure to smoke, exposure to smoking role models will be very different for Jack and Grace. What about the uh, wider environment and in particular the tobacco uh, retail environment that Jack and Grace will be exposed to? Well, um, you know, the, the, the picture here that's shown on the left hand side, thankfully, is a thing of the past. And we have been successful here in Ireland in passing legislation that has improved uh, control of the tobacco retail environment. Uh, but yet still, uh, we have over 20 outlets registered that sell tobacco products across the country. And we know that despite the good work of our colleagues in the environmental health services, 
but as a consequence of some of the issues that there are in relation to the regulatory tools that are at their disposal and the, the resources that they have available that the, the regulation of this environment simply is not commensurate with the level of risk that there is when you consider that these products are going to kill one in two people who use them regularly. Uh, we know that uh, two out of 10 inspections of tobacco retail environments that are conducted by our, the environmental health services here in Ireland uh, would find that those retail environments are unsatisfactory. Uh, we know then that one in 10, 10 test purchases that are conducted with minors would have an unsatisfactory outcome. And I'm showing here at the bottom right hand corner of the slide here some very significant data from colleagues in Scotland, which where we're looking to replicate here in Ireland, but we, we don't quite have the information systems just yet that enable us to do this. But this is, this is showing uh, data from Scotland that we would expect to see replicated here, which indicates that Jack and Grace in terms of the retail environment in the areas in which they live will be more likely to be exposed to outlets that sell tobacco products than children that are living in more affluent neighborhoods. Uh, moving on from that then, um, as a consequence of those exposures that I just described, uh, despite the fact that we've made huge progress, albeit per recent SPAD data potentially stalling here in Ireland, albeit that we have made huge progress in terms of reducing, tackling uh, smoking initiation among young, pill, ch young children. We know that there's um, a social differential um, in terms of youth smoking. So we know that um, against the backdrop of uh, reducing smoking initiation across uh, children and young people in Ireland, that uh, smoking uh, initiation is more common among children who live in more deprived neighbourhoods. Uh, E-cigarettes has been mentioned already, so that is very much a, a, a game changer in terms of the tobacco control landscape. Uh, we know that there are issues there in terms of um, increasing use across, across youth and, 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 and children. And one of the features, and, and we've engaged in research here in the HSC around this, and one of the features that we know about e-cigarettes is that uh, the traditional risk and protective uh, uh, factors that we have relied on in terms of protecting our youth uh, from um, exposure and use of tobacco products, they seem to operate differently um, in terms of um, e-cigarettes. So we're dealing with something which is new and which is a very different type of challenge compared to the challenge that we have been able to make progress on, which is uh, tackling uh, the, 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 the initiation of tobacco product use by children and young people. And then uh, once smoking is initiated, uh, we know that uh, Jack and Grace, as children from more, children and young people and young adults are uh, living in more deprived neighborhoods, we know then that they will be less likely to make a quit attempt than uh, smokers that are living in more affluent areas. And then when they make those quit attempts, uh, they're less likely to be successful. So all in all, uh, the odds are against Jack and Grace when it comes to being able to have a fair and equal chance of experiencing good health. And as I've illustrated in terms of those previous slides, uh, despite the progress that we've made and the positive impact that we've had at an overall population level um, in relation to smoking in Ireland, we haven't had the same impact for Jack and Grace, for those children that are born in more deprived uh, neighbourhoods and those children that are more vulnerable um, in terms of smoking initiation and continuing to smoke. And as a consequence then, are more likely to experience the preventable ill health, disability, and premature mortality that's associated with smoking. So, as I said, you know, tobacco control in Ireland is certainly not a done job, and especially not, I think, and this is something that I'd really like us to hold in our mind in terms of the conversations this afternoon, certainly not for the most vulnerable in our population here in Ireland. And, and certainly we need to put our foot to the floor, we need to intensify and accelerate the current good efforts that we have ongoing uh, within the HSE and, and, and across the country in terms of tackling, tackling tobacco use. Uh, we have relied very appropriately and very heavily on the MPAR model from the WHO that has served us well in terms of designing and implementing high impact tobacco control measures. Uh, we have under scrutiny at the moment, a new piece of legislation. And I think the discussion that's happening this afternoon is very timely in terms of making sure that that's passed in a way that optimizes the opportunity that it affords us to try and strengthen our tobacco control here in Ireland. But really, if we want to get towards the tobacco end game in Ireland, we need to do more than just intensify our business as usual efforts. 
we need game-changing strategic policies, game-changing legislation, game-changing new measures. If we're to move from trying to get control of tobacco use in our population to trying to uh, eliminate it permanently, the commitment that our government have made to our people, particularly to our young people, our most vulnerable people, if we're to deliver on that, we really need new, bold, game-changing efforts um, in terms of tobacco endgame initiatives. And on the slide here, I have summarised some of those potential measures of which tobacco, uh, tobacco 21, the measure that we're discussing this afternoon, is one of those measures. And I think it's very welcome that we're opening the discussion today in terms of Tobacco 21 as one of the new end game measures that we could implement here in Ireland. And insofar as that discussion this afternoon is very, very welcome, it's also critical to ensure that we recognise that that measure in and of itself will be useful, but will need to be complemented by a range of other measures across these different tactical pillars that I have set out here in terms of product-focused tactics, user-focused tactics, market supply-focused tactics, and institutional structural focus. Uh, so a whole suite, suite of additional measures will be required if we're to deliver on this uh, governmental commitment to our people to move Ireland towards being a tobacco-free society. So how do we get there? How do we move on from tobacco business as usual, tobacco control business as usual, towards identifying and realizing those new bold opportunities to try and deliver on tobacco end game in Ireland? Well, I think the conversation that uh, Norma, the uh, ASH committee of the Irish Heart Foundation are opening this morning is very important in terms of moving the discussion on and opening opportunities for us to think about new bold measures to try and deliver on tobacco endgame here in Ireland. Um, I think we need to adopt new mindsets when it comes to tobacco use in our population. I think we need to reignite the sort of urgency that we've seen in the past in relation to tackling smoking, the sort of urgency that we're seeing at the moment in terms of tackling COVID in our population. We really need to harness that and apply that same urgency, that same urgent mindset to tackling smoking in our population. Uh, we need to have new minds on the issue. So I think it's really welcome this afternoon that we're going to hear from Aoife and we're going to have that youth perspective um, in terms of uh, this debate and discussion in terms of tobacco use in the population trying to move towards tobacco end game. And really, I think it's these conversations that we're having this afternoon that's going to bring forward the new ideas and the new actions that, that are going to move us towards um, starting to deliver on our government's commitment to our people, to our children, and to our most vulnerable in our population towards delivering and ensuring that they can enjoy a tobacco-free society uh, rid of the uh, premature mortality, the disability, the ill health that's associated with tobacco use. So thanks very much. Paul, well, thank you very much indeed for your thoughts and uh, ideas about how we need to move to the end game. Uh, lots done, but a hell of a lot more uh, need, needing to be done, more needing to do. Um, I'd like to open the, um, the session now to questions from the audience uh, and invite Amanda and Rob and, of course, Paul to, uh, to, to, to join us for, for a Q&A. We're a little bit short of time, I think. Um, let's see, it is 15.25. I think we just have 10 minutes for, for the Q&A. While we're waiting for Mark to collate any, any questions from the audience, maybe I can, I can kick off. Um, first, uh, a question, I suppose, perhaps um, for Amanda or Amanda and Rob. In, when, when the smoke, the indoor workplace smoke free legislation was um, considering, considering being introduced, a lot of people said you have to wait until smoking prevalence is low before you can start to do these kinds of things. Um, do you feel that that's the same for Tobacco 21? And indeed, Paul, I see you're nodding your head there. You might like to comment as well. Should we, should we wait until our rates are lower? Should other countries that have higher rates not consider this until their rates come down? to a, 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 a more lower sort of Western European level? 
or does it or is it the worse the rates the sooner you need to do it i would say we look at this uh from a population perspective if you sample by polls both smokers and non-smokers they have supported across the board 75 percent or more uh raising the sales age of 21. even smokers don't want their kids to start smoking and so i think that the idea that we have to have some sort of a threshold i think is uh, not likely to be true um but people are ready to do something i mean you will lose more people this year to smoking in ireland and you lost to COVID over the last two years. Uh, and I think it's that recognition we have to bring forward. Yeah, that message has sort of gone a bit dead now at this, at this point, um, but it just needs to keep being reiterated and comparing it with the COVID mortality is, 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 is a nice way to make it, make it fresh, as it were. Thank you. Paul, what, what do you reckon? Is now the time for Tobacco 21? Uh, very much so. I think the time is now, Shane, and I think the discussion that yourselves at the at Ash Ireland and the Irish Heart Foundation are opening this afternoon, I think that discussion is really welcome. Uh, the population need is there, the evidence is there, and I would suggest that the public support is there as well. And um, I, th I think in particular in terms okay. of the urgency that there is around this, I would look at uh, some of the recent findings from the SPAD data, which would suggest that the great reductions that we've seen in terms of youth initiation have started to taper off. I would be very conscious as well of the threat that we have um, on the horizon in mm. terms of e-cigarette use and the, the evidence uh, collated and analysed independently by our, our health research board here in Ireland that would suggest that children uh, who vape um, or use e-cigarettes um, that they are more likely to initiate smoking as well. So I think the need is there, and in particular those findings from SBAD Ireland and from uh, the HRB would underscore the urgency for action. And I would say uh, to our, 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 our political system, uh, you know, the commitment is there, their own commitment is there towards a tobacco-free Ireland. We are well off track in terms of delivering on that commitment. And, and this is a much needed measure there's evidence base to say that it will work. And I would suggest that the support is there uh, among smokers, among non-smokers, and across uh, the population age groups. Okay, thank you. Chris Macy is going to be talking about a survey um, that absolutely supports what you've just said there, that, that the support is there amongst the Irish population. So we, 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 I look forward to hearing what he has to say. A, a question that has come in from the audience, um, somebody would like to know what was the biggest challenge in the USA, USA in introducing Tobacco 21? Rose? Well, it's clearly the uh, amount of money that's generated by sales of cigarettes. If you look at a typical convenience store in, in the US, uh, about 40% uh, of their revenue comes from the sale of nicotine and tobacco. And of course, the- How much 14? Did, did you say 14 or four? Zero. Four zero. Four zero, oh, right, okay. Wow. Four zero, I mean, that's a yeah. lot of money for a retailer and they see, yeah. of course, if you take away the kids who are gonna be their eventual customers, yeah. uh, bad things will happen to their bottom line. Uh, and so they oppose. Of course, the large tobacco companies have enormous lobbying power, not only in the United States, but also in the legislature in Ireland. One way we got around this, and you don't have this uh, privilege in Ireland, is we went locally to local health departments and local cities and states and avoided the lobbying power in the legislature that uh, the tobacco companies could bring. In fact, if I had one suggestion to make to you, I would try to stop the preemption that you currently have. Right now, local governments are preempted in Ireland from making decisions about the health of their local citizens in terms of, of tobacco control. If you can get that preemption reversed, then Limerick or Cork or Dublin could themselves make uh, a law to raise the age and it would spread like wildfire. Um, so that's an opportunity that you may want to consider. Interesting. Is that true, Paul, that, that Cork can't do it? I mean, the Republic of Cork can't go off and do a solar run on this? Uh, I'm, I, I, the Kingdom I think, of Cork, should I say? I, I, <laughs> I think, Shane, if it were, they, they, they might have already, you know, um, in, ter in, in terms of the spirit down there. But um, I, I think we have a, a real opportunity 
with the legislation that's currently under scrutiny uh, by our by our government at the moment, by our the House of Oireachtas, um, that's looking to affect very overdue modernization to the regulatory environment around tobacco retail and nicotine retail in Ireland. I mean, it's, it, it is shocking. And I, I, I think most people in the public wouldn't be aware that at the moment there is no legislative prohibition on uh, the retail of e-cigarettes to uh, children, to minors. You know, mm-hmm. so, so we, we urgently need to see the passage of that legislation, which will modernize and strengthen the regulatory arrangements in relation to the tobacco uh, retail environment in Ireland. And I think within that uh, legislation, we have the opportunity, we have the hooks uh, to deliver on Tobacco 21. And I think that's something that our legislators need to seriously consider. So the next, that's the next step. Just, I, think, I think we have the yeah. foundation in place with the heads of bill that are currently under review at the okay. moment. And I think it does provide a foundation upon which Tobacco 21, a much needed intervention, an intervention that has evidence based behind it, an intervention which I would suggest would have high public support. And uh, that's an intervention which I believe with the current heads of bill would be very implementable um, in terms of the foundation that the new heads of bill will place. Okay, thank you. There's a couple of questions popping up here. Um, yeah, I, I, this question relates to your talk in particular. What are the particular mechanisms that help low-income people to quit smoking? Because you made a very powerful uh, presentation of the horrendous disparities uh, in, by social socioeconomic status. Yeah, no, d- d- definitely. I, I, uh, thanks very much, Jane. No, I, I know for ourselves within the HSC Tobacco Free Ireland program. Uh, we we recognise that um, over the last couple of decades, we've made huge progress in terms of tackling smoking at an overall general population level. And we think now we need to start to differentiate and focus in on those subgroups within our population where smoking prevalence continues to be high. Uh, We're in the process of reviewing and revising our uh, strategic programme plan. uh, And we'll be publishing that next year. And as a, a piece of work to inform Uh, the development of our next programme plan. We have worked with the Institute of Public Health in Ireland, um, an all-island body which Mm. is dedicated to trying to improve health and tackle inequalities, to to answer that very question. So to uh, analyse and assess and offer us advice in terms of how we can strengthen the delivery of uh, tobacco control as a health service executive so as to have the greatest impact on our most vulnerable groups. We know that uh, price is a measure that uh, has a very uh, profound impact um, across the social groups. And I think there's a lot that we can do in terms of our uh, stop smoking offerings. Uh, We know that uh, price of uh, nicotine replacement therapy can be a barrier to people accessing one of the safest and most effective tools that we have to help people stop. And we know that there are particular quirks in relation to the um, general medical scheme um, and, uh, and, and, and out-of-pocket expenses that some of our poorer smokers would face were they to seek to access nicotine replacement uh, therapy. So we are persistently offering that advice to our Department of Health that that issue needs to be um, examined, as well as some of the, the, the uh, particular issues that there are in relation to uh, taxation on nicotine replacement therapies, because we know that when somebody makes a quick attempt, if they access those safe and effective supports, they're just much more likely to be effective in their effort. Sure. Okay, thanks, thanks, Paul. Just on talking about cessation, there a question for Rob. You had a very nice slide with the with the uh, the, 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 the the two pans on a on a set of weighing scales, and in your one of your latter slides, you showed that the weighing scales was very heavily tipped against e-cigarettes being a useful contributor to cessation, I I think was the point you were making. I just wonder how you feel about the approach they've taken in the UK. Ireland has remained quite neutral and cautious about um, the whole e-cigarette use use of e-cigarettes for cessation, um, whereas the UK has gone out really strongly pushing it and wondered whether you feel that is wise or foolish. I think we all thought, hoped that e-cigarettes would be the best way to get our smokers, I mean, I'm a physician, to get them to quit. And indeed, a few did quit. But now as the data has come forward, 
uh, the initial prognostication, A, that e-cigarette smoking is 95% safer than traditional combustible smoking has proven to be untrue. Um, first of all, we realized only after 30 or 40 years that traditional smoking was terrible for you. We've had e-cigarettes now for maybe a dozen years in population use. Mm -hmm. We have no idea what's coming. But we see plenty of evidence uh, for lung disease and heart disease coming down the pipe. The other part of this is, does e-cigarette smoking really help people quit? And I think the overwhelming evidence is no. People do start smoking e-cigarettes and smoke less because the rate of damage is so rapidly upward for combustible cigarettes that smoking both e-cigarettes and combustible cigarettes leaves you with dual toxicity. So I think the evidence is now e-cigarettes cause uh, nicotine addiction in kids and don't really help smokers get off because of the dynamics, the pharmacodynamics of the e-cigarette. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we should probably, I should pull, call the Q&A to a halt now. We're just a little bit over time and I don't want the, the, this to snowball as the afternoon goes on. So it, it remains for me to thank Rob, Amanda and Paul very much for three very different and really, really interesting and thought provoking talks. Thank you. And uh, I'd like now to introduce and welcome Chris, Chris Macy, Irish Heart Foundation Head of Advocacy. He's going to present findings from an, an Ipsos MRBI survey on the public's view of Tobacco 21, an issue that Paul raised, raised a, uh, a few minutes ago, and we get a lot more information now from Chris. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, um, uh, uh, Shane. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you can see that slide. This is a one-slide uh, presentation. Um, I suppose we've, we've heard today how um, uh, Tobacco 21 law in Ireland is justified, I suppose, for three reasons, really. Firstly, it's proportionate because of the damage it does, um, and even more so to smokers who start young. Uh, secondly, it will be effective based on the US experience, and also the reduction in smoking rates in Ireland uh, when the legal age of sale was increased in 2002 from 16 to 18. Um, and it also doesn't uh, breach um, uh, young people's rights. Um, you don't obviously assume a whole set of adult rights at 18. Uh, there's lots of things you can't do under the age of 21, uh, you know, such as adopt a child. You can't drive a large passenger vehicle and you can't stand in local and European elections. There's also lots of uh, pubs and nightclubs, uh, certainly around Dublin, where you, you can't get in if, if they don't wish you to under the age of 21. Uh, but there's another key consideration, um, as you'll see on the slide here. Uh, it's whether the Irish public would support a tobacco 21 law and I'm very happy to say that the answer to that is a resounding yes. Um, an Ipsos MRBI poll that we carried out in conjunction with this conference found that 73% of the over 15 population in Ireland support the tobacco 21 uh, law here uh, and that includes 71% uh, in the 18 to, four, uh, to 24 uh, age group. Uh, support was also solid uh, among men at 71%, women at 74%. It was over 70% in each province of the country. Um, and there was also uh, over two thirds support in all social groups, uh, the lowest being in the AB uh, category, 68% and the highest in the C1 at 76%. So as far as the Irish Heart Foundation is concerned, um, these results send a very clear message to policymakers that the Irish public want decisive action uh, to save another generation from the health catastrophe of smoking. And also, as, as Paul was talking about um, a few minutes ago, uh, to start looking for an end game to tobacco addiction. Um, the Irish Heart Foundation uh, is, um, is supporting this wholeheartedly and will be communicating that message as loudly as we can to politicians starting from tomorrow uh, when we are appearing before the Oireachtas Health Committee to discuss the, uh, the pending uh, tobacco and e-cigarette uh, legislation. So um, as I say, uh, just to conclude, um, we're uh, fully behind this measure. We're going to lobby as hard as we can for it. 
um, and um, you know it just makes sense. It's got to be done. We've got to get it through. Um, again, as Paul said, we need bolder action uh, to um, to move things forward. So that's all from me. Um, I'll hand you over now to uh, Dr. Angie Brown, the Irish Heart Foundation's medical director, who is going to chair the next session. Thanks, Amy. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, it's really great news that um, we've got so much positive support for this. So I was delighted uh, to see those results. Uh, and now I'm very pleased to uh, be introducing Aoife Nirian, who is from the Limerick Kula Nanog. She's an 18 year old student and she's had lots of opportunities, uh, including working with Healthy Limerick on the Not Around Us project. And very importantly, she's going to really comment on Tobacco 21, giving us the youth outlook. So thank you, Aoife, if you'd like to talk to us now. Sorry, my window slammed closed there uh, by accident. Uh, but uh, so hi, as you said, my name is Aoife Ryan. I'm a college student from Memory City and I'm the national executive member uh, for Memory City and County Corn and Oak. Um, so throughout my time partaking in youth politics, I spent a good few years since I was 15, uh, working with uh, Healthy Limerick, Healthy Ireland and the Limerick City and County Council on a, what once was a local project, but has now become a national project called Not Around Us, which focuses on the denormalization of smoking in uh, children and youth friendly areas. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a PowerPoint or a lot of statistics or anything to share with you today. So hopefully I'll be able to keep your attention otherwise um, with just me. Uh, so hope I'm not too boring, but yeah. So I began working with Not Around Us uh, when I was only 15, and that's the age when we begin to transi transition into late teenagehood. This is a time when a lot of people uh, decide they want to start doing new things, um, try out new stuff, decide what we want to do with our lives, what we want to do in college, the subjects we want to do. And for a lot of people, it is the age when they do start drinking or smoking. Um, it's no surprise that peer pressure runs rampant throughout those age groups. Um, so I, as we know, it's not really shocking to anyone that people do start drinking and smoking before the legal age of 18, unfortunately. Um, as disheartening as it is, I've, I'm only 18 and I've already had friends who have started smoking, quit and then started again. Um, at my age, I shouldn't have to be thinking about the fact that I'm probably going to outlive the majority of my friends by at least 10 years. Um, that's like a really troubling fact to me and it's not really something I should be worrying about uh, at the age that I am. Um, it started off as a common misconception that my generation was the one that had kind of stopped the vicious cycle of smoking, but as all the statistics that you've been shown today have clearly revealed, that's not true. Um, when my own parents found out that a lot of my friends and peers smoke, uh, they were really shocked because they thought that their generation was kind of the one that had kind of stopped this like early teenage smoking. Um, and they were like, but you're taught in schools now how bad smoking is. Like your bus drivers don't smoke when they're driving you to school anymore. Um, or things like that so I, I wouldn't think it would be as popular and like you get all the presentations and you know all that it's bad for you and it's true we do I can't count on my hand the amount of times that I've seen a picture of a diseased lung pre presented to me in school and how many times I've been told how bad it is for me but yet there are still people of my age my own friends who still started smoking and that's not to say that young people are like dumb or stupid and that we don't know that smoking is bad for us we're fully aware and we don't go into our teenage years hoping to become addicted to nicotine and hoping oh my god yay I'm gonna be smoking for the rest of my life when people pick up their first cigarette that's not what they intend on doing a lot of the time it's just that you're at a house party or you're out with friends and one of them has one of their brothers or sisters cigarettes and they're like let's all try this and then that's how it all starts so I think we need to focus more on preventing teenagers from ever picking up a cigarette while they are still incredibly young and susceptible to societal pressures. As with any problem, the goal is to always stop it before it begins. So campaigns like Tobacco 21 and Not Around Us aim to achieve this goal. Changing the legal age of purchasing tobacco products to 21 years old is an action that I wholeheartedly support. I work in a shop and it's slightly disheartening the amount of times that I see people coming in with their IDs that show that it's exactly their 18th birthday. And the first thing they want to do is buy a lottery ticket and a packet of cigarettes or a vape. Um, buying a lottery ticket, I get. It's fun. Uh, but I don't think it should be a goal that once you turn a certain age, you'll be like, yay, now I can buy cigarettes. Like, 
it's it should not be something that people are looking forward to. We need to make it be harder for young people to gain access to cigarettes. I don't believe cigarettes should be available to anyone who's still in secondary school because they have much better things to be worrying about, like how they're going to enjoy their last years of secondary school before they become an adult and they have actual responsibilities to worry about. They shouldn't be worried about how they're going to fund their habits or go an entire school day without having a cigarette before they even turn 18. Our nation has a responsibility to our young people to raise the legal age. They've made significant efforts, but Tobacco 21 would be the right move to make the most difference. After my years working in Not Around Us, I spent a lot of time thinking about how important the denormalization of smoking is. Um, Not Around Us focuses on making sure children do not see adults smoking while they're playing in playgrounds or parks or they're around their primary schools because we do not want young children growing up thinking that smoking is somehow part of normality. But teenagers need to see that as well. We always think about like who's inspiring our young people, like our 13, 14 year olds, like our next generation. Like, who are they looking up to? And while we'd like to think, yeah, like major political figures, actors, singers, all those things, it's not technically true. In my opinion, and just from my own personal experience, when I was 13 or 14, the people I looked up to the most were the 17 or 18 year olds that were in my school. The people that I thought were like going on, graduating, moving on to the next stage of their lives. They're gonna be adults soon. And that's who I was looking up to. And if I saw them smoking, it was gonna get into my head that that was the normal thing to do. So the perfect solution is to make sure that young people aren't ever seeing anyone smoke or even thinking about smoking until they're old enough to make that choice for themselves. Because whether or not you smoke is a choice, but when you're young and when you're being pressured to, or when the opportunity is presented to you and you haven't fully developed how to make proper decisions for yourself, it's not going to be as fair a play as if you were like maybe 21 and making that choice. 18 is viewed as this somewhat like perfect age in which like the clouds part and something we know exactly what to do with ourselves all of the time. Um, as someone who is freshly 18, I know that not to be true at all. I still have a lot of learning to do. Um, I know myself, I'm in no position as of right now to make a decision that could potentially affect my health and well-being for the rest of my life. People mature at different paces, but the desire to try new things and go a little wild as we approach adulthood can overcome even the most mature person's maturity. Um, it can found that can have some disastrous effects that we've clearly seen how smoking can affect people's lifespans and just their quality of life in general as they grow up. Um, because of this, I believe the more campaigns like Tobacco 21 and Not Around Us that exist, the better. I'm appealing to all decision makers who could possibly aid in this effort to listen, but especially to Ireland's young people. Any time that you are making a decision that, re that regards a certain age group, you have to consult them and make sure that it's what they want as well. We may be young. But we also do usually know what we want and what we think would be good for us. If you want to know what young people in Ireland want, make sure you're asking young people in Ireland. Don't assume you always know exactly what they need or want. Listen, and then hopefully someday sooner rather than later, we can all work together to create Ireland's first tobacco-free generation. While unfortunately it's not my own generation as people had hoped, I hope the one that is flourishes. So thank you all for your time today. Um, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much indeed, Eva. It's so important to have uh, the youth perspective. You had uh, raised lots of very relevant points there, which uh, we've all made note of. And I think it's really hugely important to have a youth advocate, both for us, to, to you know, in terms of uh, policy makers, but also for your peers and for other people that you're, you know, that you're at school with. So thank you very much for that. Um, and now I'm going to, I'm very happy to introduce the next speaker, who is Dr. Emmett O'Brien. He's a consultant respiratory physician in Beaumont Hospital uh, and an honorary clinical lecturer um, in medicine in RCSI. He's done a lot of research in the past, but in particular has explored pulmonary disease, phenotypes and smokers uh, in, help, in understanding tobacco smoke susceptibility in those with COP and emphysema and he's going to talk to us about the impact of youth tobacco use on lung function and development. Thanks very much Emmett. Thank you Angie and it's great to hear uh, Ethan's perspective on uh, what we've been talking about today. So I'm going to share my presentation on the impact of uh, youth tobacco use on uh, lung function and development. So I have no conflict of interest to disclose. So uh, in that time, I'm 
go to look at tobacco 21 effectiveness and we've heard some of the us experience and, and reiterate that uh look at the state of play for irish youth tobacco use in, uh, at present uh, and then examine the harmful effects of tobacco smoke particularly as it pertains to physical health uh, lung development growth and lung function and finally looking at what we've learned in recent years about lung function trajectories in copd uh, and i'll explain that shortly so if we look back at irish tobacco policy it's really been uh, very impressive what's been achieved in, in a relatively short span of time from the smoking ban in public buildings uh, to the increase of the age of sale to 18 that we heard of recently uh, uh, from chris and then the workplace uh, smoking ban which has uh, uh, changed society really in 2004 and, and since then it's been a, a lot of progress towards our, our goal of 2025 for having a tobacco free generation and this is stated for, from tobacco free ireland's perspective as less than five percent smokers in 2025 and as part of that now, we're talking about Tobacco 21 and raising the minimum age for tobacco purchase to 21 years of age. So we know that Tobacco 21 policies are effective and they can prevent or delay product initiation amongst youth. In the landmark Needham study that we heard from Alison earlier, over a four year period, smoking reduced significantly from 13 to 7%. And this is compared to nearby communities, uh, which had a, a, a less uh, of a drop of about 3% in that same time period. This has since been replicated across various states, with overall approximately 40% lower odds of monthly or established smoking amongst uh, uh, teenagers aged between 18 and 20 years of age in states with tobacco 21 laws. And this remains a very favorable uh, uh, policy uh, in the United States, with over 75% of people approving of it. And as we heard from uh, uh, Dr. Crane, over 50% are certainly higher in smokers as well, as they don't want their children to smoke either. Now, uh, in our recent MRBI poll, we've heard that Ireland is in a very similar state with 73% uh, favorability for similar policies. So it's, uh, it's working in the United States and it's time to, to bring it in here. In California, they saw a drop in illegal uh, tobacco sales to under 18s by 50% approximately, and slower increases in, in youth e cigarette use. Raising the smoking age can reduce the health burden of smoking in society. And, and this is where this is so important. In terms of youth tobacco use, smoking remains the single biggest threat to public health. Over 6,000 people die from smoking-related lung disease in Ireland every year, and significantly more, again, uh, suffer from chronic illness. Significant efforts have led to reduce smoking prevalence, and in particularly amongst Irish school children, it's dropped since uh, 2010 from 12% to most recently 5% in 2018. However, there are still uh, exceptions where under uh, 25s are increasing to roll their own cigarettes and are three times more likely to use that uh, product compared to cigarettes. And this has impacts on filtration and, and other toxins that may uh, be easier to inhale. Uh, we've heard about vaping, and this is increasing amongst teenagers and almost double the prevalence in the most recent study uh, compared to cigarette usage. And nicotine is the root cause of tobacco addiction. Younger adolescent e-cigarette users in the US are four times more likely to ever smoke a cigarette, and three times more likely to be current smokers at two years of follow-up. So what are the effects of tobacco smoking and youth health? Well, there, there are many and diverse, in particular from a respiratory perspective, chronic coughing and splenic expectoration, chronic bronchitis. There's an increased susceptibility to COVID-19 and influenza, a increased risk of blood, uh, blood clots, as well as reduced lung function and growth trajectories. Fertility can be affected as well as cosmetic effects or complexion effects and skin tone, as well as teeth and bad breath. Overall, there's not much uh, reports on uh, adverse well-being and use of smoke, uh, and that can be underestimated. And we know about the long-term risks, uh, specifically for heart disease, chronic lung disease, and lung cancer, and, and you can see the list of cause of death listed uh, to the side there. So what about lung development and growth? Well, the, the, the lung prenatal uh, for birth, uh, lung growth occurs in five stages. Uh, and after birth, in the first number of years in particular, uh, the alveoli, which are the units of the lung that exchange air uh, with the bloodstream, um, they, they are formed in a critical period. Uh, the blood vessels around them are also being formed at the same time. And, and this is a particularly sensitive time to, to, to be exposed to tobacco smoke. So maternal, so uh, pregnant, smoking in pregnancy and, and maternal smoking in particular uh, have influences in, in early age at this point. We know that lung growth happens in a particular spurt during uh, puberty, where height uh, uh, contributes significantly to the growth of the lungs, 
Um, this is somewhat different between, there's slight gender differences between men and women. However, uh, both uh, ex experienced significant growth in lung, lungs and during this teenage period. However, uh, lung growth also continues into early adulthood. Uh, and th there's a smaller but significant rise in lung growth in that period between the age of 20 and 25. Lung formation, its development and growth is susceptible to the adverse effects of tobacco smoke at all stages, throughout pregnancy, childhood, and early life. So it's important to remember this fact. So what can this lead to? Well, chronic respiratory disease in particular is my area of interest. And the most common one being chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, also known as COPD. And this is a common preventable and treatable disease that's characterized by persistent respiratory symptoms, airflow limitation, uh, due to either airway or, air, or alveolar abnormalities caused by significant exposure to noxious particles or gases. So that means the lung itself has been exposed to these areas uh, or these toxins and being damaged. Here we can see on the left, sort of the classic phenotypes of somebody who smokes who gets recurrent infections and is uh, overweight and uh, gets experiences of recurrent chest infections. And somebody on, on, on the right of that picture who's thin, uh, muscles have, have wasted and they have very low oxygen levels. At a microscopic level, you can see destruction in the structures of the lung, and this is what leads to emphysema. You can also see thickening in the airway walls, which uh, produce more mucus, leading to increased coughing. There are early life factors, as I mentioned, particularly maternal smoking. Uh, however, parental smoking in general increases exposures. There's also exposure to air pollutants, uh, PM10 levels, et cetera, can be associated with the development of uh, early life asthma, as well as bronchitis and chronic lung disease later in life. And then childhood respiratory infections can also be important. In terms of youth smoking, uh, this has been shown, and I'll show you the data shortly, uh, imp to impair gro lung growth potential, as well as increase airflow limitation, as well as early onset and more severe types of COPD. There is a dose relationship, a dose response relationship between the amount of cigarettes that teens smoke and the slowing of their growth uh, in, in terms of lung function and lung size. Uh, syner there is a synergistic effect between uh, youth smoking as well as environmental risk factors, uh, such as the early life risk factors I mentioned there, uh, just there. So in terms of what you can you expect in, in a youth who smokes, well, some studies have shown that from even an early age, at the age of 16, uh, uh, children who've smoked have lost, uh, have, have increased their amount of airflow obstruction. And this is generally measured by the amount of air that you can blow out in a second, which is called FEV1. Uh, and, and this is dropped by about a percentage point by the age of 16. Uh, and you can also measure the amount of airways resistance, and this is increased. And this is generally due to narrowing of the airways or increased mucus that's been produced as a result. It can also exacerbate underlying other, uh, other lung diseases such as asthma. The classic paradigm for the development of COPD involves a rapid decline in lung function, which is the FEV1, from a normal level in adulthood. Uh, 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 and this is indicated on the graphs uh, here in C, uh, where you can see an accelerated decline in lung function by about 50 mils of lung volume each year. However, uh, recent data has shown that half of all people presenting with airflow limitation had a normal decline in their lung function, but actually started out at a low initial value. And it's this insult, this early decline in, uh, in maximum lung growth potential that is leading to a significant uh, burden of COPD in adult life. So most COPD, especially severe uh, types, can be attributed to three different trajectories starting with lower lung function in childhood, and then either a subsequent normal or, or, or accelerated decline at that time. Personal smoking history can accelerate lung uh, function decline and amplify the, the impact of early life tobacco exposure on lung function. And this is postulated to be due to preventing recovery from early acquired deficits. So whilst if you are a smoker, you have a, had injury to your lung and you may have other risk factors, if you stop smoking at an early age, you may still have that uh, uh, ability to recover lung function that you may otherwise lose. So if we look at these lung function trajectories that can lead to COPD in summary, we can see that the classic hypo hypothesis where lung function uh, starts to decline in an accelerated fashion in adulthood, and this is generally linked to smoking cigarettes or tobacco. The new paradigm which is in relation to early life, life and youth determinants of, of lung development, particularly related to tobacco exposure, are key factors for lung growth. 
Uh, and it's these uh, significant impacts in this, at this critical stage of growth that can, uh, in, in approximately half of cases, lead to COPD in adult life. So in conclusion, in relation to this, the best predictor of lung function in late, in, in, uh, later in adult life is lung function at a younger age. Uh, and we're not good at measuring this, uh, but when we've looked at this at population data, it's, it's emerged in, in, in the last uh, decade or so. So in summary, Ireland has a strong history of leadership in tobacco policy. And we know that tobacco 21 policies work internationally. Uh, teen cigarette smoking is the classic avoidable environmental exposure. And in general, we've heard 75% of people agree that a tobacco 21 policy is, is a workable solution for this. Lung function development in, in utero uh, uh, infancy and childhood has long lasting effects on respiratory health and, uh, throughout life. And this has been underestimated up to this point. We know that lungs can continue to grow and increase in size during early uh, adulthood until the plateau was reached in the mid 20s. This failure to attain peak lung function in early life and other youth environmental exposures, particularly tobacco smoke, is strongly linked to the development of COPD. And we know that now half of adults diagnosed with COPD have had impairments in their lung development in childhood and throughout adolescence. So thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Emma. It's, uh, it's really quite scary when you think of how uh, smoking is affecting uh, the lungs at such an early age. We'll have time for questions at the end. If you'd stay on, that would be great. And now I'm going to um, ask um, Professor Catherine Hayes uh, to speak. She's the Associate Professor in Public Health Medicine in Trinity College, Dublin. Um, and she's had a lot of uh, experience in smoking related issues. She's done research uh, in tobacco, principally as PI, population health trials, addressing implementation and outcomes of smoking cessation interventions on women's health. And she's going to talk to us about youth smoking evidence from Trinity College, Dublin. Thank you, Catherine. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I'm delighted uh, with the invitation to speak to you uh, today um, on a survey that we carried out of uh, smoking at Trinity College in Dublin um, uh, of student smoking. And I'd like to just acknowledge my co-authors, um, first of all, who um, uh, three students, Sean, Sarah and Melissa, who uh, were second year medical students who collected the data for the survey. Martina Mullen, Health Promotion Officer at Trinity, and Dr. David McGrath, the Director of the College Health Service, the students who completed the survey, and the School of Medicine at Trinity College, and the findings of the survey were published earlier this year in the Irish Journal of Medical Science. Uh, Paul has shown you this slide already, so I won't dwell on it. The main aspects that I want to point out are that uh, of the 17% of the population smoking in 2019, 4% were daily smokers and 3% were occasional smokers. Um, 2018, we have uh, data from the Healthy Ireland survey of age breakdown, and we see that 19% of 15 to 24 year olds um, uh, were, were current smokers. Um, and we also see that uh, the next group in, in terms of uh, 15 to 25, uh, the prevalence uh, gets much higher. So really important that we, 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 we do something here. In terms, in, at Trinity College, we have the Tobacco Free Trinity Initiative as part of our tobacco policy. Um, again, with the aim of achieving the National Tobacco Free, Free Ireland goal of a smoking prevalence of less than 5% among students and staff. And Trinity is a tobacco free campus with uh, just three very small exceptions. Some examples here of the work from the tobacco tree, uh, free initiative there in the pictures. And our research was to provide an insight into the smoking habits of students, focusing primarily on those who smoke occasionally and are socially. And I will talk now, uh, just give some definitions of that. We defined occasional smoking as any smoking which occurs on a less than daily basis, so non-daily or intermittent. And social smoking then is the subset of occasional smoking, which is smoking primarily carried out in social contents, uh, contexts. Um, you can see there friends and acquaintances with alcohol, other people's homes, but not their own home. 
uh, we did a survey of daily and occasional smoking in Trinity in 2013, and we found then that occasional smoking was more prevalent than daily smoking. But we didn't have a breakdown on social smoking. And overall, there's very limited data on smoking, uh, social smoking available among university students. So the aims of our study were to determine the prevalence of occasional and social smoking among the third level students, evaluate students' attitudes to occasional and social smoking, including perceived benefits and harms, determine whether when they commenced uh, smoking, the reasons for this, as well as their continued smoking habits, and determine the effect of alcohol on social and occasional smoking. So our participants were undergraduate and postgraduate students who were 18 years and over. It was a cross-sectional online uh, survey in April 2019. Uh, we collected data on demographic characteristics and smoking, uh, smoking behavior. Um, smokers were asked to self-classify into daily occasional or social smoker, uh, previous smoking history, smoking duration, number and type of cigarettes, previous quitting attempts and quitting attention, uh, the risks or benefits of occasional and social smoking, and e-cigarette use. The age at which they started to smoke, what prompted them to do so, the impact of alcohol on their smoking habits, their awareness of the health risks associated with occasional or social smoking, their beliefs as to whether social or occasional smoking increases the likelihood of becoming a full-time daily smoker and their perceived benefits of being a social or occasional smoker. So turning to our results, uh, 1,300 responded um, out of a total of 18,000 and we, we got about 1,267 adequate, uh, um, adequate data uh, for analysis, which is about par, I suppose, for these types of surveys. Um, 62% were female and 38% were male. In terms of the non-smokers, uh, we had 66% uh, defined as non, which was a combination of never smokers and 22% were ex-smokers. So the remaining 33% then, uh, we had 8% daily smokers, 4% of occasional um, non-social smokers and 21% of occasional social smokers. In terms of what prompted uh, the students to start smoking, 57% of all current and the past smokers identified peers as the strongest factor that influenced their decision. And we know that from the international literature. And if you focus in on the social smoker, um, the rate there is, I mean, 58% was the, 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 the biggest prompt in terms of starting smoking. Uh, stress relief, um, more common in the daily or occasional smokers, less so with the social smokers and uh, enhancing image, more of an issue in terms of daily smokers and less so for occasional, uh, whether they were social or non-social smokers. 97% of all current smokers reported that alcohol uh, increased their smoking habits. And of course, you can see there 52% of the social smokers only smoked while drinking alcohol. Um, and that kind of defines their category in a way. Um, in terms of quit attempts, now it was the daily smokers who had tried more of them had tried to quit in the last 12 months, uh, or they were trying or actively planning or thinking about quitting. Um, compared to the, um, the biggest group of the social smokers, where only a third had tried to quit in the last 12 months, and 38% were just thinking about and planning to quit. And the small number of the non-social occasional smokers, um, there, um, they were somewhere in between. So our daily smoking rates uh, at 8% were much lower than the 15% for 15 to 24-year-olds, which is what the Healthy Ireland Service report. Uh, but the combined prevalence of self-reported occasional, non-social and social smoking in particular was much higher. The daily smokers were more likely to have started smoking at a younger age, starting at 15 or lower than the occasional or social smokers who started at 18 or above, suggesting the gradual progression from occasional to daily smokers to daily smoking. And that's supported by findings um, from Robertson et al. from 2016, where they followed students up um, over 17 years, and they found a progression rate uh, from occasional to daily smoking of 13%. All current smokers report that alcohol increased their cigarette intake, and many students were trying to quit at the time of the survey. So our recommendations were that the Tobacco Free Campus um, Committee develop anti-smoking initiatives 
specifically targeting first year students. And because of COVID, we've been unable to do that this year, but it's, it is certainly part of the orientation for 2022. Widespread circulation of information about the benefits associated with smoking cessation and the availability of cessation programs. And we take EFA's point on board where the knowledge of the risks was, was high. Uh, so we will focus on the benefits, which is much more likely to get engagement. Um, our cessation programs will be adapted to increase the focus on occasional and social smoking and to address the impact of alcohol and social smoking habits. And we have a wider recommendation as well that social smoking be included as a separate subcategory of occasional smoking in future Healthy, Ar Healthy Ireland surveys, at least in the youngest uh, age group. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, indeed, Catherine. Very interesting results. And again, I think hopefully we'll have time at the end, just uh, if you wouldn't mind staying on so that we can... Um, have a few questions there if that's okay. Um, in the interest of time we'll uh, continue though and I'm delighted now to introduce Dr Matthew Sadlier. He's a consultant adult psychiatrist in the Mater Hospital and he's going to talk to us about the neurobiological effects of smoking on mental health. Thanks very much Matthew. Um, hello, uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, I'm now just going to share my screen and I hope, hang on a second, I'm going to just uh, do that here, yes, and I come into share screen and I come to here and I share. Now, can everybody see the presentation, can people see the presentation? Can I get a feedback? We can. Yes, we can see it. Thanks. I only need I only need one person to tell me. That's all I I, I need. Um. Okay. So I've had ten minutes here. This is a talk I've spoken before, so it, it it flips between a couple of things. Essentially, the points that I'm going to try and make today is covered in the first slide here, which is well-established and well-known principle that ingestible and or inhalable substances can affect our brain and our behavior, okay? We know that alcohol makes us drunk. We know that cocaine has effects of excitation, euphoria, increased energy. We know that cannabis has effects of psychosis, unusual thinking, and just general neurotoxicity. We know that opiates make us drowsy, and we know that LSD can induce hallucinations. Now, most of these substances evolved as plant-based compounds, and they were probably used as a defense tactic by the plant. So with alcohol, we know that it's a yeast that attacks fruit, and the yeast eats the fruit. Alcohol is its excretory product, and that largely the alcohol is there to kill off any other invading yeast that might see the fruit as a um, tasty meal, okay? Cannabis, we think, is the same. Obviously, cannabis is very poisonous, so the cannabis plant evolved cannabis, so animals would try and eat that plant, and they probably died. Um, same with cocaine. No. Now, however, to larger organisms such as ourselves, these compounds have effects on our physical health and effects on our brain. And I suppose what I, my interest in tobacco is that often tobacco's effects on physical health are overshadowed the effects of its neurobiological effect. Um, and that's totally reasonable because again, if you compare cannabis, uh, coke, sorry, tobacco and the active ingredient of nicotine and the detrimental psychological effects it has, you know, compared to something like cannabis, you know, it's massively overshadowed in that way. So it, it's, it's kind of reasonable that we focus on the lung effects, but that is to say that there is a brain effect. Um, I'm gonna skip one or two. This is just talking about people with mental health. And I say we only have 10 minutes or so. So I'm going to skip that little section just to say that the first thing is smoking is listed as a psychiatric disorder. OK, being addicted to tobacco, i.e. the nicotine in tobacco, as you can see from this list, is one of the categories in the international classification of disease of substance dependence. And as you can see, it's in at F17 is tobacco, you know, and it's given similar way to cocaine, cannabinoids, opiates, alcohol, and other substances of abuse and addiction. Okay, what is a dependency? Well, a dependency is a strong desire of a sense of compulsion, 
difficulties in controlling substance taken, a physiological withdrawal state, and I shall come to that in a moment, evidence of tolerance, i.e. increased dose, is required to produce the same effect. And we, did, we know this happens in smoking because people get up to 20 a day, maybe. Some, most people don't go beyond that. Some people do go beyond that. Progressive neglect of alternative pleasures um, and persistent with the substance abuse. So that is what a dependence is. If you have those manifestations, you have substance dependence. Again, this is a paper published by David Nutt in the uh, Lancet 2010. And largely this shows harm caused by drugs in our society. And as you can see there, harm to others in darker color, harm to users in lighter color. And tobacco comes in at number one, two, three, four, five, six um, as the most harmful drug with interesting, a high rate of harm to others, which was obviously passive smoking. Um, and a relatively high rate of harm to the user. Okay, what are the myths of smoking? And it's really interesting when we hear the report from the previous speaker saying that a lot of people smoke because it helps them with stress. Now, the problem with this is smoking has never helped anybody with stress, will never help anyone with stress, and is not anything that improves people's anxiety. Smoking does not improve your mental health or any symptoms of mental disorders, okay? However, there's a belief that it is useful in alleviating stress, okay? Now, in reality, what is probably happening is that the half-life of nicotine in the human body is something around 90 minutes, an hour to 90 minutes. So at about 90 minutes to two hours after smoking, somebody starts to go into nicotine withdrawal. And nicotine withdrawal produces symptoms of anger, anxiety, dysphoria, difficulty with concentration, impatience, insomnia, restlessness. And obviously, you get all these feelings, you smoke a cigarette, you suddenly think, oh, all these feelings have left me. The cigarette has relieved my anxiety. While in reality, the cigarette is the thing that caused your anxiety in the first place, and that is how the cycle of addiction goes. Same thing with benzodiazepines, same thing with sleeping tablets. Most people who had sleeping tablets in this country actually don't have insomnia, but they have an addiction to sleeping tablets. They stop their sleeping tablets. They can't sleep for a number of days because they feel they have insomnia, but actually what they have is the withdrawal effect of sleeping tablets. OK, also constipation, cough, dizziness um, have less evidence supporting, but also may be part of the withdrawal effects from, from smoking. Cigarettes don't improve psychological symptoms, but they treat the withdrawal effects with nicotine. I suppose that is my first major point about the myths of smoking and what it does to our brain. It has a direct effect on our brain. Nicotine has a direct effect on our dopaminergic system, our cholinergic system, and a number of other neurotransmitters, and the absence of that effect produces symptoms. Depression, smoking, and smoking cessation. And this is a really interesting study, um, which showed that patients attending the general practice, um, low mood, anxiety, and stress were reported as triggers for smoking, which I've described before. And the reason it's a trigger for smoking is because it's withdrawal. People said that smoking gave them a sense of control over part of their life. Um, some people describe being bored and smoking, that smoking relieved boredom. Well, it is an activity, it's a ritual, you know, you open a pack, you take it out, you, you, you do all those things. Um, but smoking helped their ongoing symptoms, suggesting to others that it doesn't describe smoking as a form of self-harm. I've tried for it, it doesn't work. Okay. Does tobacco use cause psychosis? This was a very interesting paper published in the Lancet Psychiatry 2015. And as I say, I've highlighted the, at the bottom, daily tobacco use is increased, is associated with an increased risk of psychosis and an earlier age of onset of psychotic illness. So we often think that people who have mental disorders smoke a lot of cigarettes because they have mental disorders, but actually, is there a two-way relationship? Statistically, this paper found a relatively, and it is, I'd have to say it was a relatively weak association, but it was still an association um, that tobacco use 
may have a contributing factor in some people developing a psychotic illness. Again, tobacco and nicotine works through dopaminergic systems, so not hugely implausible. And here's another paper on cigarette smoking cannabis use are equally strongly associated with psychotic-like experiences. Okay. Um, myths about smoking and mental health. So this is about people who have mental health disorders who are smokers. Um, as we all know, the, the percentage of people who have serious and injury mental illness, which largely means people who suffer with either schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, which is give or take two to 3% of the population, um, smoke heavily and that they don't want to give up their smoking. However, this paper shows that people with mental health problems are just as interested in quitting as those in the general population. And that 47% of psychiatric inpatients, and this study was done in Australia, I have no great reason to think that our numbers would be different, um, had actually made an attempt to give up smoking in the previous 12 months. Okay, Evidence-based guidelines are just as effective in people with mental illness and smokers with mental disorder require monitoring for medication adjustments. Okay. I'm going to skip that one as well, and I'm going to skip that because these are more to do with mental health services rather than actually smoking. And I know my time is limited, so I'm gonna talk two more slides here. Again, I'm coming back to this concept that nicotine and smoking is psychoactive, i.e. it affects your neurotransmitters and it has brain effects. This is a paper on a very good review article from 2015 and nicotine in the adolescent brain. And it shows that adolescence, as we all know, is a very sensitive phase of cognitive maturation and development. So at the start, middle and end of adolescence, brain functioning is quite different in different areas. But critical to this process are nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in your brain and what binds to nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, well, nicotine. And nicotine is being found to be a neuroteratogen that exerts long-time maturational effects at critical stages of brain development. So smoking at an early age, even aside from the oxygenation and the lung effects, actually the nicotine itself coming into your bloodstream, going to your brain can potentially cause longer-term difficulties. And that can cause long-term difficulties for addiction to smoking as well as possibly other substances. And we can come to talk about the neurobiology of addiction if people are interested, um, can possibly have long-term implications for people's cognition and more importantly, long-term implications for people's emotional regulation. But my final point, and if there's a take-home message from my little talk today, there's two of them. One is smoking does not relieve stress and anxiety. Smoking only treats nicotine withdrawal, which causes stress and anxiety. My other point is what smoking does to sleep. Now, we all know that sleep is essential. Sleep is essential at all ages for our brain growth, for memory development, but also for emotional regulation, also for control of emotional symptoms. We know that um, if you sleep deprive somebody for a period of time, as they've done in many studies, people's attention disimproves, their concentration disimproves, their emotion disimproves. They become more impulsive in their behavior. They express more negative thoughts. They engage in riskier behavior. They engage in lots of different things. And if you have sleep deprived somebody long enough, they may even start to become psychotic. Okay, and how does Tobacco, there's a disorder called tobacco-induced sleep disturbance, it's TISD, and that was coined in this paper here. And tobacco, surprisingly, decreases sleep efficiency, decreases total sleep time, decreases slow wave sleep, decreases rapid eye movement sleep, which is critically important for brain development, memory consolidation, um, increased onset, so it takes you longer to sleep, and you basically are in a very light stage of sleep for a longer period of time. Other outside of the brain effects, tobacco obviously through its effects on lungs can cause sleep apnea and it can also cause restless leg syndrome. Um, the reason probably of these happening is largely because again, 
of nicotines binding to cholinergic receptors in your brain. That leads to central release of dopamine, activation of nicotine receptors, enhances the neurodegenerative inhibition of sleep promoting neurons in the ventrolateral preoptic area. So basically, the sleep promoting neuronal part in the VLOP gets hit, long story short, because the nicotine leads to an increase in neuro noradrenaline, which inhibits sleep. Okay. Sleep is a significant problem among those mental health. Sleeping cessation, yes, can have mental and physical benefits. And I thought I had a reference in that, and I may have skipped over to a paper that was also published that showed the people who suffered with mild to moderate depression who were smokers, actually coming off smoking had a much stronger beneficial effect on their mood and anxiety symptoms than uh, starting an antidepressant or anything like that. Um, sorry, I'm going forward and back. There's some references. So all I'll say in summary is three things. One, smoking does not help your mental health. It may help. All it does is treat nicotine withdrawal. Number two, smoking has serious problems with sleep. And we know that people, if they're sleep deprived, that causes serious problems to brain health and brain functioning. I'm going to turn on the light here because I think I'm starting to get a bit dark. Um, that then leads to, and the, other, the final point is, I'm sorry for going on a bit long, that we know the half-life nicotine is about 90 minutes, as I said. So people go into sleep smoking withdrawal at about an hour and a half to two hours, which is why most commonly they're sold in a pack of 20. Um, and that's why if you're a smoker, you don't really get through a night without having to wake up because you go into nicotine withdrawal. You know, so you don't get eight hours sleep because you're in nicotine withdrawal, unless, of course, you go, you complain of insomnia. And unfortunately, what tends to happen with some of these people is they get put on a sleeping tablet to treat long term nocturnal nicotine withdrawal. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak and um, I'll be around for any questions if anybody has any. Excellent. Um, thank you very much in, indeed, Matthew. That was great. Um, and it's really, I love that message. I think it's so important that uh, smoking doesn't help stress or anxiety because it's the thing that people throw out all the time. So we really need to get that message across. So I'm going to ask a brief, we are starting to get some questions in, but I would like to just start off by asking Emmett two questions really about his talk. I wonder if um, there were any gender effects about tobacco smoking um, on youth lungs, because we know that in female, adult females kind of metabolize nicotine differently. So I wondered if that had been found. And then if you had a comment on the effects of e-cigarettes and, and lung function and, and maturity. Um, so to begin with the first question, I suppose uh, we know that uh, women in particular don't go to the same height as men, so their lungs tend to be smaller. Uh, we, I mentioned earlier there's a dose response relationship with the amount of uh, tobacco smoke that you have. And obviously, if you're putting a similar number of cigarettes into a smaller space, the damage potential there is, is greater. Um, there are differences in the maturation of the lungs as well in, in that you know, airways develop and the lung itself, the, the structure of the lung develops and there's slight gender differences in that. So women, uh, girls uh, in adolescence, they tend to reach a, a peak earlier in their lung growth, uh, sort of 16 years of age, whilst uh, men uh, are, are a little bit later, 18 to 21, and then both continue uh, to increase their lung function for, for years after that into adulthood, uh, as I outlined. So yes, the tobacco affects uh, the, the, the female lung slightly more. Generally, it's thought due to a dose response uh, relationship, there may be other hormonal effects, et cetera, that may be at play there as well. Uh, there may be more environmental uh, uh, triggers uh, as well, given susceptibility at, at a younger age. Um, but yes, women's lung function tends to be a little bit lower uh, if they've smoked compar in, to a comparison amount to, uh, to a male. And your second question is about the impact of e-cigarettes and the development of the lung. Uh, to be honest, I think the data on that isn't really uh, there at the moment. Uh, the, the studies have generally focused on the impact of tobacco smoke 
uh, combustible uh, uh, tobacco smoke. Um, I suppose what really is there, and, and I think um, Dr. Crane from uh, Ohio uh, from Ohio spoke uh, about the impact of addiction and then using it as a gateway into into cigarettes. Um, so I think you know over over time the risk of using uh, e-cigarettes uh, may not necessarily be with what's in them or, or, or what, precisely, but more of what they represent and, and the impact it will have a, on, on your level of addiction, your trend to, to using more cigarettes in later life. Thank you very much. Um, well, there's some questions coming in now. Thanks, Emmett. Um, there's a question for Catherine. Um, Catherine, in your view, would increasing the, the legal selling of tobacco from 18 to 21 reduce smoking and tobacco initiation among students? Um, and also they wondered whether you explored um, why students smoke socially. Okay, um, thank you. Well, the first on the first point, um, I would most definitely support um, raising the um, the legal age of access to twenty one. I think, uh, and Trinity College would very definitely uh, be very supportive of that position um, because I mean we have seen from our data uh, that they, they would, even though it was cross sectional, but it does suggest a progression uh, from occasional to becoming uh, full time daily smokers. Our daily smokers were, were older, the social occasional were younger, were more likely to take up uh, cigarette smoking at age 18, I mean, when they start college. So um, I would definitely uh, be in favour of supporting that. I mean, the reasons uh, given uh, for, you know, taking up uh, smoking and social smoking was very much around uh, peer pressure, um, you know, very much the peer pressure in terms of socialising. Uh, yes, I, I, I think that comes across in most studies, actually. Yes. Um, and, um, and I suppose then there's a, a question here, probably for Matthew. Uh, the mental health and brain development on young people is something that should be explored more. Um, and maybe Eva can comment on this, actually. The question is, could it be communi communicated to young people um, through any social marketing or health promotion campaign? Because I know that Aoife was talking about, you know, the youth need positive benefits to sort of, I suppose, stop, stop them starting. But do you think, and, and they know what the bad things are, but I wonder if people realise actually about the mental health effects and whether, do you think Aoife and, and then maybe Matthew Arthurs could comment on that? Do you think it's worth trying to sort of make that better known? Yeah, I, I think definitely to... Uh, push the idea that smoking is not in any way an anxiety reducer uh, because that's what most of the like, people my age that I know who smoke that's their excuse a lot of the time they say that they do it because when they it helps them calm down um, but obviously as we know that that's like not true um, because smoking is not an anxiety reducer but yeah I think I think from coming from me personally as someone who is between the age of 18 and 21 so this law will affect people my age I I think the only way to kind of convince people is to kind of take like get a give like get rid of the access because I feel like no there's like almost no amount oh sorry I don't know cut up there but there's almost no amount of um promotion that could possibly stop create an entire smoke free generation I think the only way to do that is to get rid of the access. Um, but I definitely think good promotion and like good information can significantly reduce the amount of young people as well. Thank you very much. And I don't know if Matthew, if you'd like to comment. I know that, um, you know, it's been very hard to reduce smoking in psychiatric hospitals and prisons. And uh, one of I think one of the reasons is because people have that belief that uh, it helps reduce stress and anxiety and it makes it easier to treat patients. I don't know if you've, uh, you know, if you can comment on your experiences about reducing uh, smoking in in psychiatric hospitals. Um, so I have two or three things. Um, I suppose the one thing to say about smoking, I like, there's a reason people smoke, and one of them is that yes, it does in the very short term increase concentration mildly, and it is a mild euphoric agent. So like, you know you do get a mild buzz from smoking, not 
you know what I mean? There's other drugs of addiction that causes a much higher euphoric effect. Obviously, amphetamines or cocaine being the kind of the primary ones. But there's a reason we don't use amphetamines and cocaine to treat depression and conditions because ultimately the negative effects are a lot worse. And similar enough with smoking. So the problem I suppose nicotine has is that in its initial usage, people do get a little bit of a euphoric effect from it. And, and it's trying to overcome that, like with all drugs of addiction, to kind of go okay, we know you felt kind of good, but actually the long-term effects is much more negative. Um, in regards to smoking among people in, I'm sorry, the other problem with the youth, if I, if I may just jump in as well, of course, is that now what we're seeing is the youth as, and I know it's a slightly but related issue, is a massive increase in cannabis smoking, which I do think just habitualizes the concept of smoking. And actually a lot of people, as we know, who use cannabis, use cannabis for resin, that they use with tobacco as the delivery agent as well. And so it is potentially possible for people who want to smoke cannabis uh, to get addicted to tobacco because they've actually used tobacco as kind of the, as, as an additive agent in, in the, the thing. In mental health services, there's very good evidence from Australia, from the UK, and actually now coming out from Ireland. So in, in my own service up in Blanchardstown, we've made the, the psychiatric unit a tobacco-free area. Um, a number of hospitals in this country have done that, and um, it's worked incredibly well. It's been largely accepted by patients and has actually been quite good. I think the big problem with tobacco has got to be, and I promise I'll stop this rant now in a second, is two things. Is one, is the boredom issue, especially in prisons and hospitals, because it was the one thing that in psychiatric hospitals you could smoke, in, in the old days you could smoke in your bedrooms. Now, obviously it's a long time since that was allowed, but it was something that you could just do. It was something to look forward to. It would break the monotony of just the activity. So in order to beat that, you have to replace it with something else and I think that is one of the big dangers um, of that and as I say it's worked very well in our place where we've reduced and my final point though is there is a slight issue on an ethical moral perspective in residential units that so long as smoking is legal if somebody is in a long-term residential unit and that is their home and we have similar questions in some of the residential units over the use of alcohol. Um, you know, can you deprive, does somebody have a human right to engage in a legal activity if they're now in a, you know, in a unit that's there for good? And there has been that question, some of the long-term residential units. In the acute short-term units, absolutely, we, we, we've managed to overcome the smoking problem. And the longer term units, as I say, there's that legal ethical problem that also applies to alcohol, you know, which is also legal. And can you stop somebody from drinking just because they're in a, you know, sorry, I went down a bit longer. Yeah. No, no, that's good. I'm delighted that um, uh, a lot more psychiatric hospitals are doing that. Um, that's good news. Um, Emmett just is going to give us an update on vaping and lung oh, injury. Yes, yeah, just on, just as Matt had mentioned there in terms of, the, the use of cannabis in tobacco and rolling it into the tobacco in particular. Um, recently in the United States in particular, there was a significant outbreak of vaping-induced lung injury, which is associated with e-cigarette use, as you may have heard. So uh, this is in relation to the use of THC or cannabinoids, which are generally uh, uh, ingested in, in, uh, in fat-soluble solutions, such as vitamin E uh, containing compounds. So they were being put into vaping uh, products and sold on the market, the black market, uh, albeit, uh, but in a, a very high level and led to thousands uh, of people being admitted to intensive care units and hundreds of deaths in relation uh, to, to using these products uh, as they inhale them, causing significant lung injury and requiring them to be, uh, you know, predominantly younger people being put on ventilators uh, as a result of that damage. So I, I guess coming back to the question, you know, the data on, uh, you know, lung development, lung trajectory, lung function isn't there for e-cigarettes, but there is uh, a certain, uh, a lot of data there in relation to the potential damage that could be caused by e-cigarettes, particularly in relation to uh, contaminants, but we don't, we don't know what's in them. If you're buying them uh, from uh, unlicensed resellers, which are nearly everywhere, uh, then, uh, you, you know, you don't know exactly what you're inhaling 
uh, as many people found out uh, when they uh, when they took uh, cannabis in, in the United States. Yeah, and I think it's interesting. One of our nurses asked me a question about what do e-cigarettes give out carbon dioxide? Because obviously you'd think it, they wouldn't because they're not burning tobacco. But in actual fact, it they do, and it depends on on the the there's such a variety of machines. And if you use the high power machines that burn a lot more of the liquid more quickly, then it does give out carbon dioxide. So again, I think that's a problem with all of these studies that there's such a huge number of different products out there and um, it makes yeah. it very difficult to study the effects of them. Yeah, and this is alluded to earlier again by Dr. Uh, by, uh, by Dr. Crane, you know, that the, the, uh, the acidification of, you know, the, the, the the pH solubility of nicotine. So uh, you have to have additives in it uh, to, to allow it to get to the concentrations that you can buy in American, in American uh, states such as Juul. Uh, the second thing is obviously, you, you know, after you take a cigarette, generally there's a pause, but with e-cigarettes, you can take hit after hit after hit. Uh, and there's different devices, in, in, you know, that you can use to take very large uh, volumes of uh, inhalations in relatively short periods of time. Uh, and, and that leads to very, you know, sudden up, uh, uptake in, 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 um, in blood concentration. We really don't know what the impact of, uh, of that is o o over time. Excellent, thanks very much, Emmett. Well, I think um, uh, the, there are no more questions now, and I think we've had a very good session this afternoon. And I know the first speakers left a message to Amanda and, and Rob said they were very happy to uh, be a resource. If people had any additional questions, we've got their email and contacts. And uh, Mark um, in the Heart Foundation, Mark Murphy, I'd like to thank him for all the work he's put in, but he can also collate any other uh, questions that people might have uh, or any queries. Um, but really now it, all that it takes for me to do is to thank all of the speakers uh, for their time um, and the effort. It was a really enjoyable uh, and very interesting. I've learned lots uh, this afternoon. Um, and I'd like to also uh, thank the audience who've joined today's Irish Heart Foundation Tobacco 21 online. And just to let you all know, there will be a survey for those who attended uh, will go out. Um, with, with, again, it's an opportunity if you want to have any further questions. So we hope really the conference has highlighted the health benefits and rationale for increasing the legal age from 18 to 21. Um, and we really be, believe now that it's time for the government to introduce Tobacco 21 laws here in Ireland so that we can reduce smoking levels among you, you young people and help protect uh, an entire new generation from the dangers of tobacco and the very, very addictive nature of nicotine. So keep an eye on our Irish Heart Foundation website for any follow up. And our, this has all been recorded if you want to look back on any uh, of the different talks uh, and just uh, refresh uh, your memory. And again, thanks very much indeed to all the speakers. Take care and I hope you enjoyed the afternoon. Good night. <laughs>